the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. When I was a kid, the toy that I wanted to get most, more than any other, was Rock'em Sock'em Robots. I don't know how many of you remember Rock'em Sock'em Robots, but they were these little kind of mechanical robots. They were about this big. There were two of them that were in a plastic boxing ring, and they were controlled by a couple of joysticks. And of course, you had to press buttons down to make the, these little robots punch their arms. And the object was to hit the other robot's head. And if you hit it, the head just right, it would make the head pop up. And that was, I thought, a very cool game. A lot of my friends had it, and they played it. And I used to go to their houses and play it. And I wanted to get rock and soccer robots. And I talked with my parents about this. Uh, I mentioned it casually, you know, just three or four hundred times. <laughs> they, uh, they said that they weren't going to get that because they didn't believe in violent games. They didn't Games. That didn't stop me from asking and from saying to them, I understand that violence is wrong, but this is just a game, you know, it's, it's so much fun, you know, it's great to play, I'm not going to go hitting people, no, no, we're not going to get that, it's too violent. Well, in the morning when I woke up and there were rock and sock and robots under the Christmas tree, I was just thrilled, I was absolutely elated, and they gave me a long lecture as to how this doesn't mean that it's okay to hit people, I know it's not okay to hit people, but I was thrilled. And the reason they got that from was because they understood I had this really strong desire to have this. That's something that parents think of, and grandparents think of when we're getting gifts for our children, for our grandchildren, and nieces and nephews. And we ask, what is it that they would really like? What do they really want? Because we want to give them something that's meaningful to them. Parents often choose gifts for their children based on what they think their children will be happy by. For years, Didubi and I would ask our kids to make up Christmas lists to prioritize things from what they wanted most, down to number five, number ten, what have you. Sometimes their lists went considerably longer than that. But God, when He looks at us, He knows what we think we want, but He also knows what we really need. He knows the deepest desires of our hearts. And when we come up and kiss the gospel at the end of Babadak, the Armenian tradition is that the priest says, Datsik is dead, or or may the Lord grant you the desires of your heart. And when we're saying that, we're not saying, may the Lord grant you whatever thing you want, but may the Lord grant you the deepest desires of your heart, what you truly want at the depths of your heart, perhaps even at depths that we ourselves sometimes have a hard time recognizing. God sees them, and our prayer is that God meets those needs. Understanding our deepest desires, our Heavenly Father sent His Son for our salvation. Christmas is a time of the remembrance of the greatest gift ever given, the birth of our Savior. It is a remembrance of the one who came so that we might have abundant life. It's essential that we appreciate Christmas as being a gift that God gave to meet our deepest needs, to meet our deepest desires, and to search for and find for the meaning in this gift. It's essential also that at Christmas we focus on Christ we focus on Jesus during this season that tends to become so materialistic, and we think about what it is that it means, particularly about the fact that it's about celebrating Jesus' birthday. Can you imagine going to someone's birthday party, and everyone gives gifts to one another, but no one gives gifts to the person whose birthday it is? Sometimes we treat Christmas that way. We give gifts to one another, but what do we give to God? What do we give to how is it that we celebrate his birthday? And this raises the question, what is it that God most desires? What's at the depth of God's heart? What do we get for the one who has everything? In the Psalms, God says the world and everything in it are mine. So what do we get for God? Well, God wants us to freely decide to do certain things with our lives because one of the greatest gifts he gave us is the gift of free will. But what we choose to do with our free will is the gift we give back to God. And so we have to freely choose whether or not we're going to follow his teachings, particularly one of the things that we are to freely choose each day, and we can choose to do or not to do, but we are certainly to choose to do on a regular basis, is to read scripture. And Jesus, Jesus taught us that the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And when we love someone with all our heart, soul, and mind, we want to be with them. We want to hear what they have to say. We want to understand their point of view. 
and you want to think about what they have to say. So part of loving God is having a deep desire to abide in his word. And during this Advent period, when we are so busy with a thousand things to do, and it's an unusually busy time of the year, do we make time for God? In this last week, how much time have you set aside to read scripture? How much time for prayer? We can, going forward, make a conscious decision to do this on a daily basis. I'm going to begin my day with five or ten minutes of prayer or reading scripture to abide in his word. And Jesus says that anyone who loves me will obey my teachings. So it's not only a matter of reading the word of God, but it's a matter of meditating upon those words and asking ourselves, how is this applying to my life? Sometimes people say, oh yeah, I've read the Bible three or four times. Sometimes people say that that lead to debaucherous lives. The object isn't to read huge portions of the Bible just for the sake of reading and say that we've read it. The object is to read until such and something touches our hearts and to stay with that prayerfully. Read through the Psalms, read through the Gospels. When something touches your heart, sit and ask, what is it that the Lord is trying to tell me? How is it that I can adjust my life to be closer to him? Jesus says, the words I have spoken to you are spirit and life. So we look at ourselves trying to conform our lives to the gospel, not as something that is limiting us, but as something that is liberating to us. And if we want to be more free, and if we want to encourage other people to have truly free lives, then we ourselves have to learn to embody the message of the gospel within us, and to share that message by word and by deed with others. So the first gift that God desires is for us to abide in his word. Secondly, we are to attend church. When Jesus began the tradition of Holy Communion, he commanded his apostles to do this in remembrance of me. He told them, get together and do this thing. And they did. And from the earliest times until today, the church, in an unbroken line from apostolic times, has always gathered together to receive the body and blood of Christ. We do that remembrance because Jesus said to do that. We follow his command. Jesus wants his faithful to gather together for worship on the Sabbath. And when we do this in his name, we understand that he is present with us and his love is manifest in our midst. Our Heavenly Father wants his children to come together once a week. The Sabbath is a day of rest, but it's not simply a day of rest of I'm going to put on my feet and watch sports all day. It's a day of resting together in the Lord, of appreciating the beauty of our Heavenly Father together and celebrating his love with one another. Unfortunately, some Christians have been seduced into believing in a kind of Lone Ranger Christianity. It's just me and Jesus. All I have to do is believe in Jesus and I'll be saved. Well, part of believing in Jesus is believing in his teachings and Jesus wants us to come together. He wants us to follow his Sabbath. He wants us to live in a certain way that he taught us to live. The church Jesus founded never said, stay on your own and worship me. The church Jesus founded said, come together and worship because being a Christian is not personal journey alone. It is a personal journey, but it's more than that. It's a corporate journey. We are pilgrims traveling together towards the kingdom of God. It's not just about our salvation. It's about one another's salvation. When someone claims to believe in Jesus, but not the church, ask them how they reconcile that belief with Jesus starting the tradition and directing that people gather together to receive Holy Communion. Those who study and choose to follow Jesus' teachings must gather together in the Holy Church. The word for church in Armenian is yegelatsi, which is from the Greek ekklesia, and both of those words mean coming out and gathering together. We come out of the world, we come out of the secular world, and we gather together as a family of faith, united by the blood of our Lord. This Christmas, I want to encourage you to make a vow to keep the Sabbath as God intended. Give the Sabbath to him. He wants you on the Sabbath, and not just during Advent, but throughout the year. So read scripture, apply it to your lives, keep the Sabbath in holiness. And thirdly, we should be thinking this time of year especially about helping the needy. We think a lot about what can I get for my brother, my sister, my mom, my dad, my kids, and we're often giving to people who have so much already. 
or what can we get for ourselves? There was actually a commercial on uh, last week that said, the week before Thanksgiving is the week of Thanksgiving. It's the last time to shop for yourself before Thanksgiving. Um, and there was, a, there was a department store that was saying, this is the week of Thanksgiving. A lot of people think of Christmas as the time of Thanksgiving, as opposed to Thanksgiving. But if we're truly to give thanks to God, we should do so not only in word, but in deed. And Jesus taught us that when we help the hungry and the thirsty, the naked, the sick, the suffering, the homeless, the widows, and the orphans, we are helping Him. We are serving Him. When we serve the cause of truth, we are serving Christ. In His teachings, Jesus made it clear that all of these ways of helping have both a physical component as well as a spiritual component. That is to say, we are to understand and to commit ourselves to helping the hungry and the thirsty and the naked and the homeless, absolutely. But we have to understand that these have a spiritual element as well. That is to say, there are people who have plenty of physical food, but are spiritually malnourished. They don't have the Word of God in their lives. And if we want to feed the hungry, we have to help make God's Word present in their lives. There are people who have plenty to drink, but they are spiritually dehydrated, and we have to make the Word of God present in their lives. There are people who are free in the sense that they're walking around, they're not imprisoned, but there are people who are imprisoned within their own sins, imprisoned within a sense of, of shame, of depression, of sadness, what have you, and we are those to help lead them to a place of joy, a place of spiritual freedom. So our call is to help those who are poor, <coughs> and suffering, and thirsty, and hungry, and homeless, and naked, absolutely, both physically, but also spiritually. When, while we are directed to support physical needs, the supporting of spiritual needs is something that is so much needed within our own families. Mother Teresa said that when she was in Calcutta, when she was together with her sisters in Calcutta, and they would give bread to the hungry, they satisfied their needs. It was very simple. They were hungry, they gave bread, and the person was satisfied. But she said in America, the hunger is much deeper. In America, there's a hunger for love. In America, there's a very deep loneliness that people live with. Who in your life is lonely? Who needs a friend? This is a time to reach out to that person, to those people, maybe even people that are difficult to be with. Understanding that God is calling to reach out, calling us to reach out to those who are lowly, who have the steeper need. In the Holy Babadak, the teaching that we both receive and are called to, to live is to distribute Christ to the world. That is to say, we are all kinds of communion ministers. In the Roman Catholic Church, they have this tradition where the faithful can go and take Holy Communion to people in the hospital. It need not be a priest or a deacon that's taking the sacrament of Holy Communion. Anyone can sign up, apply. Uh, any parishioner, any laity can be a communion minister. In the Armenian Church, we have that tradition as well, but we have it on a spiritual level, that each of us are called to be ministers of the body and blood of Christ. And this is particularly clear in one of the prayers said by the priest during the Babadak, where we hear, Look down from heaven, from your holiness, and from the glorious throne of your kingdom, Jesus Christ our Lord. Come to sanctify and to save us, you who sit with the Father and are here sacrificed. Deign to give to us of your undefiled body and precious blood, and through us to all the people. When we attend church, when we live this life we are called to live, we receive spiritual gifts that we can distribute to those who are spiritually hungry and famished. These are not gifts we are to keep to ourselves or only to share amongst those who are already full. These are gifts we are to distribute to those who are so needy. Brothers and sisters in Christ, as you consider giving gifts this year, remember God. Remember this is God's birthday. Offer to Him by reading Scripture regularly and applying these words to your life. Offer to him by keeping the Sabbath and by building up his holy church with your time and talent and treasure. Offer to 
him by giving to the needy, understanding that people have both physical and spiritual needs. And when we do this, then we truly honor the spirit of Christmas. We honor the spirit of the one who came to help and feed those who were hungry and 